for the last time I will introduce a speaker, but this is not sad because this is the continuation of travel writing and how Patrick Lee Fermor has inspired other writers to continue his writing and their own writing. So I'm very happy to introduce Christopher Bakken. Christopher is a poet, translator, chef, and a professor of English at Allegheny College, we call it. He spends as much time as he can in Greece, or with Greek friends, and is also the director of writing workshops in Greece, in Thessaloniki and Tassos. Tassos plays a, a role in uh, your travel writing. Your first poetry collection, After Greece, from 2001, won the T.S. Eliot Prize. And uh, the travel book that you will also be quoting from, talking about, is Honey, Olives, Octopus, Adventures at the Greek Table. Your title is Confessions of a 21st Century Philhellene, Writing Under the Influence of Patrick Lee Fromer. Welcome. Um, on behalf of all the presenters and the audience as well as the last speaker, can we please um, give a round of applause to Charles and Trina for setting this up? I also feel I'm last, slightly like uh, I'm the final exam. Um, and clearly, the final exam will involve drinking. Uh, but I, I feel really honored to have spoken with this particular group of thinkers and scholars, and I hope I don't repeat too much what they've said, so we'll just think of this as a playful summary. Because I've spent half of my life living in or traveling in Greece, a lot of people hit me up for travel advice. In addition to a list of my favorite islands, Uzo palaces, and obscure museums, I tell all of them if they travel to Greece with one object, it must be a copy of Patrick Lee Fermer's Mani. This isn't very good advice, as it turns out. Not surprisingly, many of them return from Greece only to report that the book, while delicious in every way, was practically useless for someone traveling to Greece for the first time. One should not turn to Mani or Rumeli seeking the names of the best hotels or a sense of the most efficient way to get to Kithira or whether one can visit Epidavros on a Sunday. And thank God for that. As Patty himself admits right away in the preface to Mani, his, quote, private invasions of Greece led him to write, quote, what amounts to the opposite of a guidebook. And yet, Patty's books are a very deep source of, excuse me, of inspiration for travelers and writers like myself who are in love with Greece and wish to comprehend and then write about its bewildering terroir. So, I've been asked to help close this weekend's program by reading a little from my own book, Honey, Olives, Octopus. Since we have been thinking about and savoring Patty's career, ideas, and sentences these past two days, I now understand what a terribly masochistic and foolish thing I have agreed to. <laughs> Holding my own words up to his, I will be the first to admit is an invitation for disaster. Patty sets the bar too high. I regard Mani and Rumeli as masterpieces of prose style. They are inimitable. But as I was writing my book, during a period of about five years, it became more and more clear to me that I was producing a text that was deeply informed by and was at least partly an homage to Patrick Lee Fermer. So by way of paying tribute to him and keep my promise to Trina, I will close with some passages from that book tonight. Before I do that, I'd like to make note of a few things I find distinctive and useful about Patty's Grease books, especially for someone who writes under his influence. I have been drinking deeply from these books for so many years that assembling these notes gave me an occasion to step way back and reflect with appropriate sobriety, I hope, on the aspects of his approach to Greece and to travel writing in general that I most admire and which often guided my own approach. As a writer, I'm obsessed with how these books were written. The fact that Greece is their subject is really just gravy for me. What, I have asked myself, did reading Patrick Lee Fermer give me 
permission to do? What aspects of his philhellenic and literary legacy am I most prone and honored to echo? I wish to answer those questions while focusing on four aspects of his work that I find important. Sorry for the highfalutin title. Uh, first, I'd like to comment on what I call the omnipresent pseudo-invisibility of Lee Fermer's literary persona. How's that for a mouthful to open things up? The most obvious symptom of Patty's genius is no doubt his hallmark golden style. Sumptuously interlarded, crackling with wit, and fueled by a sprawling and often intimidating erudition that is still perfectly welcoming, if not openly flirtatious by turns. A polyglot, his literary vocabulary tunnels so deeply into the language that we must be prepared to encounter arcane and tantalizing words like calipagus, if you take the Greek apart, it's nice ast, um, and poshalik. Few writers have been as eager to mine the English language and several other languages for obscure or to delightful effect. In Patty's books, we encounter sentences so surprising, angular, and meticulously constructed that sometimes the challenge is to keep reading, since to move forward means we mustn't stop to reread, rubbing the edge of the brocade a little more and admiring the artifice. Patty's sentences call attention to themselves as sentences, to the fact that they are sentences, and yet they possess a sense of both improvised freshness and permanent inscription. I can think of several poets, but only one other prose stylist of the 20th century, Vladimir Nabokov, whose books I open at random, as other people do the Bible, just to read sentences aloud to remind myself what's possible. Pulling against the omnipresence of this style is the near invisibility of Lee Fermer in his own books. Of the four most important Philhellenic prose writers of the 20th century, Lawrence Durrell, Henry Miller, Kevin Andrews, and Lee Fermer, Patty is the least prone to transparent self-observation. Durrell, Miller, and Andrews spend a fair quotient of their time involved in acts of self-scrutiny. Their books get a lot of energy from what their authors come to recognize about themselves. By comparison, Patty is much more likely to see through the looking glass, as Lewis Carroll might put it. This is ironic, of course, since Patty's biography is so fascinating, as we've seen all weekend. Very few travel writers, actually very few human beings, can boast a life story as rich as his. And so it's that much more remarkable that he chose to write books that were not really about him, at least in the superficial sense. It's worth noting how infrequently Patty gazes inward as if doing so would have to happen at the expense of so much exterior treasure. He seems to prefer a kind of dissolution into Greece, and his camouflage is so complete and his engagement so deep that we sometimes forget he's even there. No doubt he, mentioned, he, he perfected this art on Crete. And yet, we have to call this pseudo-invisibility, since at every moment in the form of style, artifice, lushness of language and profundity of observation, Patty is present, directing our gaze outward along with his through the lens of how deeply he knows. Artemis Cooper has helped us come to realize that all of his books, including those about Greece, were agonized over for decades, in part because they were, as Wordsworth would put it, recollected in tranquility. The books bear the mark of that temporal distance, and in fact, they often draw attention to it. I think, for example, of the first, excuse me, the final sentence of the first chapter of Mani, which comes after a very lengthy aside about the Jews of the Peloponnese, complete with numerous parentheticals, dates, and quotations. Just a few pages earlier, you remember, our hero has fallen into a wine-induced slumber atop a tower in the village of Anavriti. So we're invited to read this dissertation on Hebraic Arcadia, learn it as it is, as little more than a drunken reverie. Then the dissertation stops suddenly. He pulls back the reins with a start, remarking, unburdened as yet by all these complications, I slept on peacefully. 
It's the as yet that's so important there. What do these conspicuous moments of narrative splitting reveal? First, that Patty's acts of remembering involve tricky negotiations and lots of imagination. Two Philhellenic selves must find a way to cooperate in the Greek books. And learning how to let both selves have their say became important in the later books too. On the one hand, we travel alongside the former self, an elegant young vagabond, there he is, whose curiosity demands he leave no stone unturned, but who is, quote, unburdened by complications, since he's simply incapable of absorbing everything. He's too busy walking, drinking, dancing, loving, and swimming. On the other hand, we come to know a more learned and arthritic self who is there years later in his brown study. This latter self handles the marionette strings, and it's his job to sort through and revel in all the multifaceted complexities the former self overlooked. For most writers, the distance between these two selves might easily be measured in nostalgia, which sighs too deeply and bathes all the past in a golden light. But Patty rarely succumbs to that. The vast tapestries of his tightly woven sentences leave only a little room for the occasional thread of emotional disclosure. And yet, I suspect that for Lee Fermer, there was both joy and grief involved in remembering and re-presenting moments that were now lost. I feel exactly the same about trying to recollect my own distant memories of Greece. I moved there when I was 22. Rewriting them is a way of reliving them. We know that Lord Byron was Patrick Lee Fermer's true spirit animal, um, but I often think of Wordsworth's spots of time when I read Lee Fermer. For Wordsworth and for Patty, returning to certain moments from the past allows the later self to be, quote, nourished and invisibly repaired. Such moments are scattered everywhere, Wordsworth said, and surely with a life as rich as Patty's, a lot of scattering had to be accounted for. Imagination and invention, he reminds us, left and right, are very much part of the painful and rewarding acrobatics of remembering. Three. Though it's a very small country, my grandfather from Wisconsin liked to remind me of the entire landmass of Greece would have fit inside the state of Wisconsin. He was very proud about that. It's a very small country, but actually Greece is vast. Trying to take in any view of the place requires a very wide lens and a sustained depth of attention. Patty, of course, was immensely skilled at peeling back the various historical, archaeological, and linguistic layers he discovers. We just learned this in Charles' talk. But I love how often the high-flying ideas and learned divagations are interrupted by moments of humane close focus. Patty obviously spent a lot of time admiring church architecture and Nicolian Towers reference books in hand. But he was equally fascinated by the human beings who actually lived atop the great stratified mess that is Greece. He reminds us that one of his aims in Mani is to, quote, situate and describe present-day Greeks of the mountains and islands in relationship to their habitat and their history, to seek them out. And seek them out he does, though the Greeks he meets by chance are almost always the most fascinating. Patty's gift at capturing the bottom nature of others should never be underestimated. He was a master portraitist, with an almost uncanny knack for suggesting real humane depth with just a few sweeps of the pen. Among the unforgettable characters we meet in Mani and Rumili, I probably think most often of the two shepherd girls, Anastasia and Antiope, who wander atop a mountaintop at the entrance to the Mani and who, quote, see nothing but God. He writes, they sat side by side on stones with immense black luminous eyes strangely compounded by innocence and wisdom under brows like arched and sweeping pen strokes which seemed to fill their entire faces. The art of rendering others 
was one he took very seriously. And of course, he drew portraits too. But they are never static. He always manages to retain a sense of spontaneity, offering quick flourishes of impression that lend his descriptions a sense of immediate and fleeting encounter. Equally etched in my mind, thanks to an uncharacteristic touch of sentimentality, Patty never had too warm an assessment of anyone, is his portrait of the salt-gathering women who live in the shadowless and desolate landscape of the frying pan, the Tigani. Though brutally impoverished, they offer their water and paximadia to the travelers. He closes the scene of this encounter with them with a slow, gradual pullback of the lens, written from the perspective of him as he, his rowboat casts off from shore. We left them there under their immense hats, he writes, growing smaller with each oar stroke. I often think of them. They are probably scraping for salt among those infernal rocks at this very second. These unbitter and miraculous women might be swept up into the recesses of time and memory unless he'd found some way to record their disappearing world and ancient way of life. Of course, Joan's moving photograph of one of the women equally helped rescue them from oblivion. There are so many characters I love. The nine-year-old boy who leads Patty up to the top of the Chora on Seriphos, pointing into a well where the head of Medusa is supposedly found. Or there's the epicure, hedonist, and second lieutenant Marco, who Patty meets by chance while descending a mountain gorge. Poor Marco, who had, quote, grown up just in time to get the Civil War as a coming-of-age present, and whose harrowing stories are shared over a blistering and bubbling leg of lamb. If, as Patty put it, quote, Greece is an inexhaustible Pandora's box of eccentricities and exceptions to all conceivable rule, we leave his Greek books with the firm conviction that the country is likely at any given moment to throw into the traveler's path characters who will illumine and deepen, if not complicate or call into question, every certainty the scholars have asserted about the place. And those of us who travel in Greece know how true this is. Finally, um, I want to speak about Patrick Lee Fermer as a verb. PLF in the infinitive, I call this. Money and Rumily are chock full of astounding information. When I teach this book to undergraduates, um, they need a dictionary and four encyclopedias. But most of my favorite passages in those books interrupt the spell of ideas by bursting suddenly into action. As when Patty dives into the sea cave entrance to Hades, for instance, or staggered, staggers through the cobweb cabins in the Tegetis, it's at these moments when our narrator really materializes before our eyes. Along with him, we too must Patrick Lee Firmer our way into the landscape. I love the way these raw physical encounters ground the high-flying erudition. These moments also remind us of his boyish, boyish fearlessness and sense of adventure. They prove that Patty was as much 007 as he was a linguist and a bookworm. His qualifications as a man of adventure, Charles pointed out a little bit ago, surely outstrip almost every other writer I can think of. Yet his wartime heroism on Crete hardly ever comes into play in the Greek books. And how easily he might have rested on those laurels which awarded him a kind of insider status in Greece that very few outsiders could boast. Indeed, about the war, he says little more than this, that it, quote, did not interrupt his travels though for the time being it altered their scope and purpose. That's putting it mildly. For me, the Mount Athos journals that are offered as the conclusion to the broken road are some of the most touching and revealing passages in all his work. And not just because Patty was 20 and I was 22 when I first arrived and recognized a little bit of myself in that. But these journals are unique, as the editors note, because they were, quote, written virtually on the spot. We have, for once, just one self at our side. Patty's 20 years old and has arrived in Greece for the first time 
He doesn't even yet know the word for Raki. That's saying a lot. Except for in his letters, we are rarely given such transparent access to the workings of his psyche and his moods. And there, I came upon one little sentence, much more of a tossed-off thought than one of his signature insights, that lit up for me on the page and explained so much about all his books. He has left the monastery at Lavra to visit a nearby Romanian skeet, and he offers this very charming and plain-spoken account of his walk back. Sounds like a kid. It was great fun talking Romanian again. I like the language and wish I knew it better. I'm soon out of my depth, but I can fake it up a bit. I ran most of the way back as it was downhill, and it is great fun jumping from stone to stone with one's heart in one's mouth. Here, we reminded that the joy of travel was, for Patty, all reckless motion. What do you do when you're out of your depth? You improvise. Or, as I like to put it, you patty your way through. I liken this patty to a shark, and you know sharks have to move or they'll suffocate. If he doesn't keep moving, he's in trouble. Um, this shark-like movement, his fondness for spontaneity and digression, asks a lot of us as readers, since we must quickly grow accustomed to jumping from stone to stone with our hearts in our mouths. Some vertigo is inevitable, but so is joy, so we hang on. Well, the lushness of Patty's prose makes us want to err on the side of slowing down, this Lee firmering, this paddying, this jumping from stone to stone pulls us lurching ahead. So we can peer along with this champion of curiosity at whatever and whomever will meet around the next outcropping of Greek stone. The tension this creates is both unsettling. It's true that nobody can keep up with him physically or intellectually, and at the same time, it's intoxicating. We will knock back another cup gladly, and then on we'll go to the next taverna or village or mountaintop or library, lurching and directionless if need be, drunk on the monologue of the most charming and dashing companion. Soon we'll find another fountain where we'll stop to drink or think again. One compensation of this kind of travel, Patty wrote, is the unchartable and unregimented leisure between the rigors of displacement. I am endlessly thankful for the fact that he allows us to accompany him on these unchartable rambles. And that's the scholarly bit of sorts. Uh, now I will turn to my own book, Honey, Olive's Octopus, and say a few things about um, how this emerge in some ways out of uh, what I've just described. Um, so first of all, my book has a very straightforward design, which my publisher liked a lot. Um, there are eight chapters in an epilogue, and each chapter uh, deals with one element of the Greek table, bread, fish, wine, cheese, meat, etc. cetera. Um, in short, my job was to think of the single best example of each of these Greek products, and then go where they are made produced by hand. That typically meant I was hanging out with grandmothers for the most part. Um, you can imagine how excruciating the research was. I had to eat cheese all over Greece, and then bread, and then olives. Um, but my publisher was very disappointed to find out that I never walked in a straight line. I'd been reading too much Lee Firmer, clearly. Um, in fact, my book tends to adopt the meandering way of the goat path far more often, um, lots of digressions and divagations. Um, my own mother, who was really pleased, you know, finally not a book of poetry, she couldn't give those to her friends, said, at last you wrote a cookbook. I said, Mom, there are eight recipes and they are completely useless. You know, Having harpooned an octopus, one recipe begins. Uh, so I learned this way of divagation from him, but I, I would also say that along the way while writing this book, um, I was writing with a similar anxiety that I think Patty felt writing his books. And that was a sense that the Greece he is describing won't be around much longer. It's disappearing. Uh, it's possible, since I was investigating food, that traditional Greek food might be all that's left. Um, 
of Greece that's not yet completely been affected by globalization and tourism and the homogenization of the Eurozone. So the book has a lot of feasting and drinking in it, uh, but it's also part elegy. And you'll hear that, I think, from the passage I'm going to read. Um, also, as a direct homage uh, that almost no one notices, but I'm going to let you in on the secret, um, to Lee Fermer as his apprentice, uh, and my publisher thought this idea was insane, um, I have adopted uh, what Patty does in his Greek books, which is on every other page at the top, there's a kind of variable header that works as a sort of indexing device for the pages that are below. And some of these are, are really hilarious. Um, I suspect that Patty uh, took the cue from this from the old Murray's Guides to Europe, uh, which use these as a way of, instead of a table of contents, here's, here's what you find out about this particular spot. So here's shallow graves and brackish water. This is from uh, Mani. News of Medusa. And of course, most famously, cockadoodle do, where we hear cock crow stretching all the way to Africa. Um, in my own book, uh, the publisher couldn't figure out how to put them on top, so they ended up on the bottom. Um, cycladic spuds and Byronic dirges. Tune in next week to find out what the hell that means. Um, Hesiodic husbandry. And of course, platonic zucchini. I'm not even sure myself what that means. Can I read to you a little bit? Here's how the book opens. I'm just going to read uh, three short passages. I don't need my glasses. I can see. No, I need my glasses. Never mind. I just can't see you if I look up. Tassos of Thassos, whose olives we shall pick, has been drinking Sipero at a wedding all night until just hours ago, in other words. So when he greets us at the port, we can see that he's a cheerful disaster. The list of things Tassos Kuzis can do is daunting. With equal proficiency, he manages to be a restaurateur, farmer, shepherd, octopus fisherman, rabbit hunter, traditional dancer, and yes, wedding singer. The fact that he served in the Greek special forces means he has other skills he cannot disclose. He's also indisputably handsome, black hair, close crop beard, irrepressible smile, which helps him play his various roles with perfect sprezzatura. It hurts me to drive slowly, he tells us, so put on your seatbelts. In spite of his hangover, he attacks each switchback. We zoom past the massive marble quarries, so huge that cranes and bulldozers at the bottom look like toys. Through the village of Panagia, where the competing identical cafes in the main square are opening simultaneously, past three deserted beach towns and around two herds of errant sheep and one lost cow. Abruptly, as we round the southern shoulder of the island, the dense shag of pine and oak gives way to a barren forest of boulders that drops jaggedly down to the sea. Tassos pulls up next to the guardrail on the wrong side of the road so we can orient ourselves. The wind is blowing from the southeast, making visible what is usually obscured. Samothraki, the most haunted and pagan of all the Greek islands, which agitates the horizon like a purple gash. Beyond that, we can see the faintly pulsating outline of Asia Minor and the low molars of Limnos. And after two more bends in the road, we spy Mount Athos, sacred home of a thousand monks and hermits and not a single woman. Legend has it no woman has set foot in the peninsula since the Virgin Mary herself. In order to fetch us at the port, Tassos left his parents behind in the olive grove so we join them right away. Don't worry, we came here to work, I remind Tassos. His parents, undistracted by the noisy fowl that surround them, peacocks, geese, ducks, and dozens of chickens, are just pouring the first coffee of the day and unloading a crate full of breakfast. Bread, boiled eggs, diropites, and freshly plucked oranges. Tassos' father, Stamatis, rises to greet me with a leathery handshake and two kisses. 
Though now sporting a harvest costume of flannel and denim, he's a fisherman and looks it. Aquiline nose, sunburned skin, a shock of unruly hair. Tasso's his mother, Evanthea, has something of the Venus of Willendorf about her. She's utterly sturdy, working here all month beside the men, and yet she radiates maternal softness and grace, her voice a joyful lilt, her face always on the precipice of a smile. Both parents seem a little stunned that I've actually come. Surely my vow to join their olive harvest, sworn after a long night of drinking the previous summer, was not in earnest. Yet here I am, with my brother in tow, stocking-capped, combat-booted, and armored in canvas and fleece. As for Tassos, well, he's picking olives in his Armani jeans. Poor Tassos. Uh, as it turns out, he's my cumbaro, so I get to make fun of him in print on a regular basis. Um, and I'm going to read two passages um, from the chapter on meat. Um, I actually chose goat as my favorite meat. Um, and I go to the island of Chios in search of a very famous uh, recipe for Hericia macaronia, handmade uh, pasta, which probably has Genoese origin. That was one of the things I was trying to figure out. Um, made with local goat. Very simple dish. And I wander about and many things happen. The other thing, um, the other reason it took me to Hios is that I'd gone there a decade before uh, and I'd driven around the northern part of the island, which was almost completely deserted. Almost every village in the northern part of the island, um, you'd walk through and it was just, as if in 1974, everyone stood up in the middle of breakfast and left and never came back. Dishes were still on the tables, sheets were still on the beds, uh, but the shutters were flapping. And we walked around a village um, looking for any human beings, if not a coffee, um, and a very old woman opened the door and said, who, who are you? We said, foreigners. Um, and then she brought us in. She and her husband were shucking kukya, fava beans, on their back patio, and they served us coffee, and we had a little talk with them. So I, I've also gone back to Hios to see if these two might still be alive. Here's the general introduction to Hios, and then I'll read the passage where I go looking for this couple. If Asia Minor is a giant, then Hios is his severed left ear. Floating just five miles from Chesma and the Karabarun Peninsula, a Kaiki sailing into the Aegean from the port of Smyrna, once a great Greek city, scene of the infamous massacre of the Greeks in 1912, and now the overpopulated Turkish city of Izmir, you'd pass the northern coast of Hios on your port side before making the turn south to the Mediterranean. Therefore, since ancient times, Hios has always looked to the east, benefiting from the gastronomic riches of the continent, including steady supplies of grain and the cultural riches of its cosmopolitan centers. In addition to Smyrna, the rich cities of Pergamon and Ephesus were just a short sail away. And in the Archaic period, Herodotus reminds us, the Heans were allied with Miletus, that famous boot camp for philosophers. But Heans have also benefited from looking west toward the Great Sea. Trade up and down the Aegean coast meant the island was an important outpost and a very desirable piece of real estate. But the real secret behind Hean prosperity and cuisine extends beyond geography, springing from an odd source, the mastic tree. Pistachia lentisis, cousin of the pistachio tree, grows everywhere in the Mediterranean, but only on the island of Hios does it weep. Only here will incisions cut into the shrub's ragged bark make it drip a precious amber resin called mastic, chewing gum of the Byzantines, breath freshener of the Turkish harem, and lauded medicine and culinary delicacy since ancient times. The flavor of mastic is unmistakable. It's sweetly floral, not unlike myrrh, with a little of the piney twang one would expect from an evergreen. Added to cakes or lucumia, not to mention alcohol, it makes an excellent digestive. Some Heans even insist that it will enkindle one's sexy bits. Curious how many weird edibles are credited with aphrodisiac powers. 
Why the microclimate of southern Hios encourages the tree to weep has never been explained. In any case, the presence of mystique on the island has been both a blessing and a curse. A gloriously wealthy cluster of mastique villages, the Masticohoria, sprung up in the island's southern Cambos region, each of them lightly fortified and arranged in pirate baffling labyrinths and alleyways and arches. Still, the pirates did to Hios what pirates do, and all the great empires have behaved toward the island predictably too. Thanks to Mastique, the island was always someone's crown jewel, endlessly pillaged and sacked and occupied as a result. And then, as it turns out, almost completely unoccupied. Uh, I've set up camp in the village of Olisos, and off we go in a really uh, crummy rental car in search of human beings. I set off early from Volisos in hope of circling all of Mount Amani and thus the entire northwest corner of Hios and its necklace of tiny villages before noon. But I don't get beyond Neapotamia, the first village, before stopping. A very old man is bent over in the road, waving his hand up and down as if patting the head of an invisible boy. At first, I think I might be driving too fast, but in fact, he's beckoning me. So I pull up beside him and shut off the engine. Around us, the village is so quiet, I can hear the seconds ticking by on my cooling radiator. The man is wearing a thick wool sweater in spite of the heat, and he's leaning upon a twisted walking stick the color of dried bone. When he puts his hand on the forearm I'm hanging out the window and leans his face in close to mine, all the hairs on the back of my neck rise. I'm sure he's a ghost, for it's impossible how much he resembles my Norwegian grandfather, already dead 15 years. I'm even more spooked when he opens his nearly toothless mouth to speak. Will his lips spell out, Apopuiste, where are you from? No sound comes except a wheezing rasp from his throat. Then I see a mesh bandage has been taped across his larynx. Throat cancer, I suppose. He smiles when I tell him, America. And then he pats my arm a few times and tells me, I'm a good boy. I smile back, of course, not really sure what else to say. So I compliment his village with a few sentences and ask the way to Halandra. That's an idiotic question, since it's only a few kilometers up the road, as any moron with a map would know. But his answer is beautiful. After a deep breath, and with considerable effort, sweeping his arm in a wide, circular gesture, he slowly rasps, Halandra, Keramos, Aphrodisia, Kurunya, Nenituria, Ayagala, Melanios, Dripes, Barbaria, Pirama, Volesos. There couldn't be a more haunting litany. This catalog of dying places I'll pass by on the road today, each name rattling in his perforated throat. After a moment's pause so we can catch his breath, he lifts the tip of his cane in the direction I'm headed and whispers, it was once a very long way by foot. Calodromo, may your road be good. It's a Tuesday morning. There's not a child in sight in Keramos, and the courtyard of the school is ankle deep in eucalyptus trash. It's not been swept since winter. Could there be any surer sign of a village's death? I duck down some stairs beneath the school's empty playground. Tiny saplings have grown up around the motionless swing set and find the ruins of the olive press, its roof collapsed and its machinery rusted black. I'm encouraged, turning down another alley to find some brightly painted feta tins, 
now geranium and carnation planters outside a silent house. To my surprise, I see a nanny goat nibbling weeds beneath a chestnut tree. Her legs have been tied together to keep her from wandering. Someone must water the flowers and tend the lonely goat, but where have they gone? There's no sound at all except the humming of some bees in the flowers and a few noisy crows. Turning back along the upper road, I find at last the blue door where Elias and Maria used to live, but it appears to have been shut a long time. Some fallen bougainvillea blossoms, dried to a dark purple, have gathered on the threshold in a pile of dust. I walk around the house to see if anyone's in the balcony. Nothing. I've come back too late. I wake the next day feeling foolish. Why didn't I knock on the door at Elias and Maria's house in Caramos? Was I too afraid to find them gone? I decide to drive back up the slopes of Amani one more time to check on them. Caramos is just as silent as yesterday, but there's no sign of the goat. That's encouraging, since someone must have moved it. But when I find the same pile of blossoms and dust in front of the blue door, I know it can't have been opened since yesterday, and my stomach sinks. Since I've come this far, however, I take a deep breath and wrap my knuckles on the metal shutters. My knocks echo within the house and no answer comes. Then, just as I've turned to walk back to my car, I hear the door open behind me. When I spin on my heels, I see Elias squinting in the bright light, one hand shadowing his eyes. There's really no way to tell if he remembers me. When I remind him of his wife's kindness and the kukya, however, he nods his head in a way that indicates he might. Elias is now 87. His wife's absence is palpable, and I hesitate to ask after her. When I finally do, he takes her picture from the shelf. She passed last August, he tells me, a very good woman. I lack the proper vocabulary to express my sympathies. My daughter checks on me, and I work when I can, Elias continues, and so my life runs on. Though I'm confident he's not left the house since yesterday, I'm happy to see that he's put himself together in an ironed plaid shirt, some blue jeans, and a knit cap. He's very robust for his age. By coming, I've obliged his philoxenia, literally friendship to strangers, or what we call hospitality, and which the Greeks take very seriously. And thus I regret my stupidity. I should have brought him a gift from town, some small offering at least, if only I'd had more hope that he'd still be here. My heart sinks further when he leads me out to the patio, has me sit in a wicker chair, and then apologizes. He has nothing to offer me. No, wait, he says after a moment, rising from his chair to step back into the kitchen. He brings me a bottle of water, having poured a glass from the tap for himself. And then he unwraps a few morsels of cheese and bread from a towel and sets them on the plate before me. From yesterday, he says, but still good. Piled on tables around us, are sheets of tin and some thick black dowels. Out of these, he crafts farasia, little dust pans. Something to keep my hands busy, he says. He creases the tin and fastens it to brightly painted handles with decorative silver rivets. There's no way he will allow me to buy one, of course, no matter how much I protest. I promise to use it proudly in my wood-burning furnos, back in the United States. Sto calo, he says, when I stand to leave. Go with the good. Before I climb back into my car at the top of the village, I turn one last time to wave goodbye. He's waited there on the threshold, the blue door ajar behind him, 
one motionless hand raised in a friendly salute. From where I stand, I can take in all that remains of Keramos in one glance, and it appears to be swallowing Elias up, and the lush green crags of Mount Amani behind him, too, slowly closing in. Thank you. Thank you, Christopher.